Staying on top of the weeds is one of the most labor-intensive parts of organic gardening. But with some good techniques and tools in your belt, you can stay on the winning side of this battle. A weed is any plant that is growing where you don't want it. Weeds are a problem because they compete with your crop. They need the same sun, water, nutrients, and space that your garden veggies need. And if left alone, will compete aggressively for these precious resources. The phrase growing like a weed takes on a very literal meaning in the garden. Many common weeds are exceptionally fast and vigorous growers. When matched up against plants that grow particularly slow, like carrots, or that don't create a canopy, like onions, these weeds can easily overtake and choke out or stunt the growth of your plants. Weeds have many ways they spread in the garden. Identifying the particular weeds you have in your garden and understanding how they propagate and spread is an important element of learning how to control them. Though different weed problems may require slightly different approaches, there are some basic management techniques that will help you regardless of the specific weeds you struggle with in your garden. The first is organic mulches. We talked about organic mulches a little bit in class three. They are things like leaves, straw, or wood chips, any natural materials that can be used to cover the soil around your plant, providing a barrier to weeds while also keeping the soil protected from the elements and helping to maintain soil moisture by decreasing evaporation. When applying organic mulches, a thorough and thick application is key. The purpose of the mulch is to block light to weed seeds and to suppress the growth of those weeds that do germinate. So if it's not applied thick enough, it will not effectively block the weeds. Depending on the material, two to three inches is usually enough, and you wanna make sure you get even and thorough coverage across the bed, right up to the plants and around the plants themselves. Mulch is a great way to suppress weeds in the pathways as well. Though some weeds will inevitably find their way through, in general, weeds that do come through mulches are easier to pull than weeds in unmulched areas. While there are a variety of materials you can use as mulch, it's important to consider their effect on your garden soil and your growing plants. Wood chips, for example, do a great job of smothering weeds, but they're a little too acidic for use on veggie beds, where they would ultimately break down and may over time lower the pH of the soil. They're great to use on pathways, though. Straw, on the other hand, is an excellent option for mulching your veggie beds. Another way to create a physical barrier to prevent weeds from growing is with the use of landscape fabric. Landscape fabric is often available at hardware and gardening stores and can be reused for many years. It can be laid in sheets along the paths and edges, or you can cut holes to plant crops into. One thing to keep in mind if you're cutting holes into it for use on the beds is that you'll be stuck with the exact arrangement of holes and spacing for the duration of the fabric's life. This isn't a problem in a perennial garden, but if you're growing annuals and want to switch things up from year to year, you're probably better off just using landscape fabric for the pathways or garden edges and sticking to organic mulches in the bed itself. All fabrics need to be weighed down or stapled into the ground with landscape staples to keep them from blowing away. And most folks will often put a layer of wood chips or leaves on top of the fabric as well to help hold it down and to make it easier to walk on. Another way to help control weeds in your garden is through careful water management. Watering just where the crop is will help minimize weeds and paths and along the edges of your garden bed. This is one reason hand watering or using drip lines may be preferable to an overhead sprinkler. But if a sprinkler is what you have and what works best for you, there are plenty other methods you can focus on outside of water management to control weeds. One way you can get a jump on weeds is by using transplants instead of direct seeding. When you plant transplants into a well-prepared, weed-free bed, you give your veggie crops a head start on the weeds because they will still just be at the seed stage. This won't be an option for every crop. For example, you can't transplant carrots. But where it is an option, this is one reason to lean towards transplants over direct seeding. Whether you are planting transplants or seeds, spacing your plants at proper intervals will help to limit the open space that weeds might otherwise grow in. Many plants, if spaced properly, will create a canopy once they get established that can help to effectively shade out weeds. 
If you are planting multiple rows of the same crop, like kale or lettuce, it's helpful to stagger the position of the plants in the rows. This will help maximize the use of the space and create a fuller canopy once the plants grow out. Even with the use of mulches, careful watering, and using transplants and thoughtful spacing to shade out the weeds, some weeds are still going to grow and ultimately these will need to be pulled out so that they don't compete with your plants or spread more weed seed. Weeding early and often is the best way to stay ahead of your weeds. Getting into a habit of removing weeds before they get very large or well-rooted is critical to keep them from getting a foothold in the garden. Most weeds in your garden probably grew from seeds that were there when you started, came in on the wind or in a batch of mulch or compost, or dropped by animals. In order to prevent a greater weed problem from developing, it's important to remove weeds before they produce seed, as most weeds produce hundreds of seeds, and they can stay in your soil for many years before sprouting. You can tell a weed is about to produce seeds when you see it flower or see little seeds or seed pods beginning to form, usually at the top of the plant. There's a saying in organic gardening that for one year's seeding, you will spend seven years weeding. You can stay ahead of this by pulling out your weeds before they set seed. Many weeds can be thrown into the compost or left in the pathways to bake in the sun. But if they have already set seed or if they are weeds that reproduce vegetatively from bits of root or rhizomes, they should be thrown in your garden waste bin or along the perimeter of your property as far from your garden as possible. Mowing or otherwise controlling the weeds along the edges of your garden is also helpful as a way to limit grass seeds or other weed seeds from spilling into your beds. There are endless numbers of plants that can grow as weeds in your garden, but it can be helpful to know a few of the common problem weeds in your area so that you can watch out for them and identify them and remove them as quickly as possible. One of the worst offenders for us here in our garden is wiregrass or Bermuda grass. Wiregrass spreads along creeping stolons or rhizomes, which are basically lateral stems that grow just at or just below the surface of the soil. These grasses can send up new shoots and little baby roots at very frequent intervals. So it's really important when you are removing this grass to try and get out as much of it as possible and remove as much of the roots as possible too. Any little piece that you leave behind can actually send out new roots and new shoots. Even when it looks dry and dead and like it couldn't grow anything, in the next rain it's likely to send out a new root or shoot if you leave it in the ground. So it's important to get it out all the way. Another weed that we have here in the garden that looks like a grass is actually a sedge. Nut sedge, similar to wire grass, grows along creeping rhizomes and it also has little tubers. I'm trying to see if we found one right here. I don't, oh, here we go. There's a little, a little tuber, a little nut, which is what gives this plant its name. So it grows and spreads by those underground rhizomes and tubers. So just like the wire grass, it's important to get it out by the root as much as possible. The, these little rhizomes and tubers can go down into the soil 8 to 14 inches deep, so it's really important to dig deep when trying to remove these. Not such as tend to prefer compact, poorly draining soils that stay wet for longer periods of time, but once they get established, they can grow in pretty much any soil type, so it's really important to get control over these weeds sooner rather than later. A third plant that grows in somewhat of a similar way to the nut sedge and the wire grass is morning glory or bindweed. This is a vining plant that sends out lots of long root networks underneath the ground. So again, really important to pull them up by the roots. But one of the things that makes this weed so problematic is that it's a vine that really can twist its way all the way up your plant. And so it can quickly go from a very small shoot to being really wrapped around your plant and very hard to remove. So it's important to remove these really young when they're still in that small shoot stage and haven't completely tied up around your plant already. Because the morning glory, the nut sedge, and the wire grass can all grow back easily from little pieces of rhizome or root, it's important to make sure that when you pull these weeds out, you remove them entirely and you don't put them in the compost because they can re-sprout in the compost and become a problem for you again later on. 
This plant right here is called pigweed. There's actually a few different species of plant that we call pigweed, but all of them are in the amaranth family. And pigweed is actually a plant that is eaten in many different cuisines throughout the world. You can eat the leaves and stews, and the seeds themselves are super protein rich. But the reason why we identify this as a problem weed in our garden and in other gardens throughout this area is because when they do produce seeds, they can produce upwards of 100,000 seeds just from one plant. So even one plant going to seed can create a problem for many years down the line. The easy solution to this though is to pull it out before it goes to seed. This plant right here I'm going to handle carefully because it's covered in little spines or thorns all the way up the stem and even along the leaves as well. This is called horse nettle and it's a problem in gardens in part because it can grow, it can spread into little colonies um, through underground root systems um, and also because it's just so hard to pull and so painful to pull. But another reason why it's a problem is because you can see from all the holes in this leaf that there's a little bug that really likes it. This horse nettle attracts flea beetles, which also like to eat eggplants and tomatoes. So it's good to keep it away out of your garden and away from the perimeter of your garden so you're not attracting more flea beetles to your garden. This larger plant right here can actually get way bigger than this. This is called pokeweed and it can have really big, strong tap roots at the bottom and grow up to 10 feet tall. It's really important to try and remove as much of that taproot as possible because as you can see from these little examples right here where we've got a bigger taproot than the actual plant itself, that's where we just, in weeding prior, we snapped off the top and then it just regrew another shoot, which is why it's important to get that out by the taproot. Many elders I know talk about eating poke salad, which are just boiled young poke plants. But it's really important to know that all parts of the poke plant are toxic. And so unless you're cooking with an elder who really knows what they're doing, I would avoid eating any parts of the poke plants. These are just some examples of the many weeds that you're apt to find in your garden. There are many other resources that you can find online for IDing weeds or figuring out what to do with them if you have a specific weed problem. Or you can always call your local extension agent or your master gardeners club and ask them your questions. Regardless of the type of weeds that are problems in your garden, there are a number of small, non-mechanical tools that can help make your weeding job a whole lot easier. Pulling by hand will work in a lot of cases, but having a few tools on hand can help to make your job easier and save your time and your back. These are long-handled hoes. These tools are good for weeding standing upright so you can save your back and do a little bit less bending over. And they're great for removal of small to mid-sized weeds, being able to get them out relatively quickly and easily from your pathways or in between your plants, um, in between the rows of your plants, but they're not so great for weeding right up close to your plants. For that, you wanna do hand weeding or use the smaller hand tools, but these guys are great for those in-between spaces. This one is a scuffle hoe. So this hoe works a little bit differently than some other hoes. You actually slide it back and forth underneath the surface of the soil and you can see that the end kind of pivots. So you would hold it like this and kind of shuffle it back and forth like that, scraping right under the surface of the soil to remove those weeds by the roots and all. This one right here is a chopping hoe. This hoe is really good for getting slightly larger weeds, weeds that are a little bit more established because you can chop at them a little bit harder and a little bit more vigorously than you can with the scuffle hoe. The scuffle hoe is really best for smaller weeds that aren't yet very well established. These tools right here are hand tools. There's a variety of different kinds. These ones right here are different types of hand hose, and these are really great for weeding up closer to the plants than your larger long-handled hose. I really like to use this one for when I'm weeding right up close to the plants um, because the point on it and the smallness of it helps to get some really great precision. This one is a little bit more heavy duty and I really like it for when I'm trying to get out weeds that are a little bit more established, like that wire grass we talked about earlier. 
This tool right here is a little bit more specialized. This is called a dandelion digger, and it's for digging up those tap roots that grow deeper down into the soil. So you would stick it right down into the ground next to your dandelion or your pokeweed, anything else that has a long tap root like that, stick it down in as deep as you can, bend back to try and lift that tap root up out of the ground. If you don't have a dandelion digger, because it's a little bit more specialized, you might have a trowel on hand, and that can work in a very similar way. Hand tools give you fine control over your movements and over weeding, so they're great for getting up close to the crops that you're trying to grow. But they can take a little bit more effort and time, so if you have the option, it's great to start with the long-handled tools and then move on to the hand tools when you're getting that area that's right up close to your plants itself. If you have a small garden bed or a raised box garden, you're probably only going to need the hand tools. When you're weeding, you wanna be thorough and get out as much of the roots as possible. Otherwise, you'll be back again next week weeding the same area. You wanna get the weeds in the pathways and in between the rows, but you also wanna get the weeds that are right up against the plants in the rows, being careful not to disturb the soil or the roots of the plants you're trying to grow too much as you do so. I like to gently hold the plant back like this while I go to pull out the weed so that I don't disturb those roots. It's good to weed on a hot sunny day. That way the weeds that you've pulled will bake off and, and die quickly, but you also, want a little bit of moisture in the soil to make it easier to weed. So the day after you've watered or after it's rained, when the sun has come out, is a great time to weed. Make sure when you're done weeding to dispose of your weeds properly, especially if it's a cloudy or overcast day, so that they don't reroot and start growing again in the place where you left them. One final way to help control weeds in your garden over the long term is through the use of cover crops and crop rotation. Growing cover crops in the off-season can help smother or shade out weeds that might otherwise take root over the winter or during other long gaps between your crops. But take care to manage them properly and mow or pull them out at the correct time because they themselves can become a weed problem if you let them go to seed. Along similar lines, crop rotation or changing up the types of crops you grow in any one place from year to year can be another helpful way to disrupt certain weed cycles and create easier conditions for weed control in your garden. A place where you've grown carrots in one year may end up being a little weedier because carrots are less competitive and harder to weed. But if you plant summer squash or cucumbers there the next year, any weed seeds that sprout from the previous year will be more likely to be shaded out and easier to pull. With all of these different weed control strategies, hopefully you now feel a little better prepared to identify and manage weeds in your garden. Regardless of how you choose to approach them, an important thing to remember is that staying on top of your weeds will take some time and attention. But it's also a great excuse to get out into your garden, enjoy the sun and the breeze, and have a little break from other life demands. With the right approach, you can view it as a meditation instead of a chore. Weeds in our garden are one challenge, and another one we want you to be really aware of are pests in the garden, as well as some of the diseases that they can bring. However, you don't need to be intimidated by insect pests because there are a lot of measures and approaches we can take to deal with them before they even become a problem. So take, for instance, this field behind me. As close as two weeks ago, there were healthy summer squash in this little patch here, and because of a certain insect pest, they were all uh, killed and girdled at the stem. Let's go take a quick look at what is left of this one squash to see if we can figure out what the pest was and what some of the control measures are we can take to prevent it in the future. So let's take a look at this summer squash we have in the field. Obviously it's dead. But looking at how it died can give us a few more clues as to what the insect pest was. So when I look here at the base of the stem, I can see that it's quite rotten, it has some cracks and holes in it, and this to me is a clear sign of what's called a squash vine borer. The squash vine borer is an insect that affects, of course, summer squashes, winter squashes, pumpkins, and to a lesser extent, cucumbers and watermelons. What happens is the adult, which is actually a moth that's orange and black and has some really pretty colors on it, will come and land around the base of the plant and lay an egg at the base. 
When the egg hatches, the larva will come out and begin to chew up through the plant into the stem, killing it from the inside out, which essentially cuts off the water and the nutrients and all the other good things coming from the roots into the plant. That's how we have this rotting happening within the stem of this squash. We're gonna cut open a little bit to see if we can find that larva still living inside the squash itself. So as I cut open the stem, I'm looking for a sort of tan, cream-colored, sort of fat-looking uh, worm living inside the stem, right in the middle. But you can see it's pretty rotten. This plant has been dead for more than a few days. And the, the pest, aha, here it is, found the culprit. It's about a little under an inch long, fat, wiggly pupa. So it's possible to cut the vine borer out of your squash before this happens, but the best tool is prevention in this case. When the plant is still young, get a small piece of paper towel tube or tin foil and put it around the base of the squash right next to the ground, and that will help keep the vine borer from actually entering the stem of your squash plant. So we just took a look at a squash plant that had completely succumbed to an insect pest, the squash vine borer. Now we've come down and we're taking a look at some of our community gardener beds at a couple of very healthy and thriving squash and cucumber plants. These squash and cucumber plants face some similar pest issues, including the squash bug. Squash bugs are an insect pest that affects not only squash themselves, but also cucumbers, watermelons, and anything else that's in that cucumber family. When we're looking for signs of squash bugs, first we're looking for their eggs. I can see on the top and sometimes on the underside of a leaf that there are these little clusters of eggs that are sort of yellowish to bronze colored. We can flick those off or scrape them off to get rid of those eggs. If they've already hatched, we can see either little groupings of the small young insects called a nymph, and they're usually a sort of light color, sort of a light green, and as they age and mature, they switch to a sort of brown and black color. At that stage, they'll be, begin to really start to suck the sap and nutrients out of the leaves themselves, causing wilting and yellowing on the plants. Another similar insect pest is called a cucumber beetle. Cucumber beetles, like squash bugs, can affect both squashes and cucumbers. Again, anything that's in that cucumber family can be affected by these insect pests. Over here we have a few cucumber plants that we have seen a few cucumber beetles flying around in. The beetles themselves can be either striped or spotted. Cucumber beetles can be particularly nasty because they can spread a disease called bacterial wilt, which will cause even greater and more extensive damage than the bug itself can cause. This results in a yellowing and eventual dying off of the plant. We want to be particularly careful to look for the cucumber beetles on some of our young plants as they can feed on the tender stems and leaves, but we should be watching all of our cucumber plants, including the fruit, because the cucumber beetle can feed on all parts. The last pest I want to talk about is the cabbage looper, or one of the different types of cabbage worms that can affect a lot of the different plants in the brassica family. Brassicas include things like cabbages, kale, kohlrabi, collard greens, and even turnips. These caterpillars can cause extensive damage. And you can see here on this plant that a lot of the leaves have been cut out by the munching of a green caterpillar. In here, we can see that there's one of these green caterpillars that's about an inch long. After you've spotted these green caterpillars, you can pluck them off just by hand and get rid of them, stomp them on the ground to kill them, and so they don't continue to feed on your brassicas. If you do let them continue to feed, they will eventually develop and mature into moths which will fly around at nighttime usually and lay eggs on your different brassica plants, which will start the whole cycle over again. Eventually, all gardeners face the issue of pests hurting our plants. Your reaction to a pest problem will depend on how much you value the damaged crop, how much it will cost you to fight the pest, your feelings about pesticides, and your personal approach to gardening. Often, when we're in a gardening store, it may seem like the only solution to pest problems is buying some type of pesticide. A pesticide is any product, either organic or synthetic, that will kill or deter specific insect pests or a group of insect pests, 
when sprayed on the leaves, fruits, or soil around your crops, so they can be very helpful. However, many gardeners try to avoid the use of pesticides as their first defense against pests because of the potential harm to you, the environment, children, pets, and other living things. There are more organic or naturally made pesticides in addition to more synthetic or chemically made pesticides available to the home gardener, but all do carry some risk of harming other living things beyond the intended pests. That's why we like to focus on another method called integrated pest management to control the pests in our garden before they even become an issue. Integrated pest management, or IPM for short, is a holistic approach to garden pests and disease issues. It predicts and then prevents pest activity before they can even pose a serious threat to your plant's health, which reduces the need for those pesticides. We're going to cover four different forms of controls or measures to deal with these pests. These four forms of control are prevention, physical control, biological control, and chemical control. The best treatment for pest problems is proper prevention, so let's go over a few preventative solutions. As we keep saying, focusing on growing healthy soil and healthy plants from the get-go is the number one way to avoid lots of problems, and this includes pest damage. Strong plants can withstand some amount of pest damage, and plants will even produce their own natural chemicals to ward off insect pests when they are healthy and receiving the proper amount of light, water, nutrients, and again, good airflow. Another tool is rotating crop families throughout the garden and across the years. Rotations disrupt the reproduction of one generation of insect to the other, especially if they're depending on that same crop family to be a food source for them in the coming year. Also, rule out other causes for garden problems. Plants being injured or looking funny can often be a result of our own error, such as over or under watering, breaking a plant when trellising, or poor spacing. Other times, bad weather like heavy rain or suddenly hot days can also cause plants to look injured. Finally, large critters like squirrels, cats, and even kiddos can play a part in causing a plant to look like it has insect damage. Garden veggies do not look like grocery store veggies, and thankfully, they taste a lot better. This is due in large part to the limited amount of pesticides we use in the garden. This can result in veggies that have holes, blotches, soft spots, or other imperfections. Your garden produce is almost always still edible, and it is up to your comfort level as to what is still worth eating. It's also important to check your crops regularly for insect damage. Take a look at your crops each time you go out to the garden, including the top of the leaf, underneath the leaves, at the top growing point, where the stem meets the soil, and any other place you can think of. Check for signs a pest has been there. Do you see small holes or tears? Are there bits of black green poop? Are there actual little insects hanging out? Detecting the insect quickly and monitoring the health of your plant will help you make decisions about what to do to treat the pests. And then many times, we should do nothing and let the plant's natural defenses fight off the insect pest. Wait and watch your crops that have insects on them over the course of a few days. If you do not notice signs of progressing and worsening injuries, such as holes in the leaves, wilting, damaged fruits, or other clear signs, your plant is likely to survive. Plant diseases can be another major cause of plant damage over the course of the season. Many plants have been bred or developed over time to have resistance to specific diseases. Reading about disease resistance in seed catalogs, on a seed packet, and online can help you find many tasty and strong varieties that resist diseases in your region. Look on the seed packet for a description of disease resistance, such as stating downy mildew resistance, or having a series of codes that correspond to different plant diseases. Physical control refers to literally removing the pests yourself or creating a barrier to the pest from getting to your cherished crops. Many insects can be removed simply by plucking them off the crop itself. Caterpillars, slugs, and snails are good, slow-moving culprits to hand-pick that can cause a lot of damage. 
spraying off groupings of insects like aphids, mites, mealybugs, and spittlebugs with a strong stream of water from your hose is also quite effective. Be sure to look on the top and underside of the leaves for these insect pests. Another tool we covered in previous classes is using thin row cover to help protect young plants from insects in the garden. Netting and woven wire can also act as a covering to protect plants from larger pests like squirrels and birds. Be sure to leave a little bit of growing space between the cover and the plant, and weigh down the cover with something heavy like a rock, brick, soiler, or whatever you have on hand. Remove these coverings once the plant is older and begins to touch the covering. Plant collars are a technique to protect young plants from insects that munch on the base of the plant, such as a cutworm. A plant collar is a little ring of material placed around the base of the plant. You can use anything from a toilet paper tube to a tin can for this control technique. Finally, shiny objects such as old CDs, reflective ribbons, or pinwheels can also protect young plants from birds. Place different objects around the garden, on the ground, or hanging up. Biological control is all about supporting a healthy ecosystem to balance out the good and the bad bugs and microorganisms in your garden. When things become out of balance, you can use the following biological methods to help control pests. Many insects you find in the garden are in fact good bugs. They might be predator insects or the insects that eat other harmful insects. They might be a pollinator like a bee, butterfly, or moth that in fact helps spread pollen to produce the fruit in your garden or the insect could just be neutral, causing no benefit, but also no harm. Getting to know the insects in your garden is a great opportunity to learn more about the natural world in your garden. If you need help identifying the insects in your garden, share images or detailed descriptions or drawings with your local cooperative extension office. We can also attract beneficial insects into the garden by planting a diversity of flowering plants like marigold, tansley, and alisum. We can also let some of our existing crops, like cilantro or broccoli, go to flower to attract different insects. Finally, some microorganisms can also be spread in your garden as a form of biological control. Bt is a bacterium that is poisonous to the insects that feed on your plant leaves. When sprayed in the garden, Bt is helpful at controlling these type of pests and is harmless to humans, pets, and most beneficial insects. BT can be found at many gardening stores. Integrated pest management is all about using prevention first, then working through physical and biological control measures. However, there may be times when you decide to use a pesticide to control a particularly tough or aggressive pest. When choosing a pesticide, read the label carefully. Make sure the pesticide is appropriate for your crop and the pest in question. In general, Aim for pesticides that are least toxic to humans, the environment, and other beneficial insects. There are hundreds if not thousands of different synthetic pesticides that we won't go into in this course, but instead we want to focus on a handful of organic pesticides that do not harm people and have a wide range of use. Insecticidal soaps are a safe option for many pest issues. The soaps kill insects by damaging their outer skeleton, particularly for soft-bodied insects like aphids, mites, thrips, and caterpillars. Soaps only kill the insect themselves on contact, so you will need to reapply often as new eggs hatch. Neem oil is another natural pesticide derived from the tropical neem tree. It kills fungal growth and can smother some insects as well. Neem oil is often diluted and sprayed on the leaves of plants as signs of fungal infections appear. Pyrethrin is the active ingredient in many effective organic pesticides for a wide range of insect pests. This chemical is made from chrysanthemum flowers and targets an insect's nervous system to kill it. While pyrethrin brace products have many different uses, it is critical to read the label to be sure to avoid harming other beneficial insects and other wildlife when applied in the garden. In the world of gardening, there are a multitude of challenges to be sure. From aphids to funguses to unknown infections, it can seem like the list of things that can kill your garden plants goes on and on. No one is an expert on all these different plant issues, so we always encourage our gardeners to lean on others, such as another experienced gardener, their nearby cooperative extension office, 
referring to the C to Supper manual, and just doing some research online. If you've gotten to this point in our series, you know how to support the health of your garden, even in the face of these challenge. Now it's time to gear up for one of the most rewarding parts of the gardening journey, the harvest.